Welcome to Hack the Entrepreneur, the show which reveals the fears, habits, and inner battles behind big name entrepreneurs and those on their way to joining them. Now here is your host, John Naster. Hey, hey, this is Hack the Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for joining me again today. I'm your host, John Naster, but you can call me Johnny. My guest today is a best-selling author, international speaker, and an entrepreneur. In 2004, my guest released her book, The Barefoot Executive, which went on to become an international bestseller. The success of this book has taken her to countless stages in countless countries, educating, entertaining, and empowering her audiences. She's been featured on CNN and Fox Business News and has consulted for companies such as Google on business growth strategies. Most importantly, she has accomplished all of this while working from home while raising for children. Now, let's hack Carrie Wilkerson. I'm going to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, Caliper. When you make a wrong hire, you feel it immediately. Your team's performance, morale, and bottom line all suffer. Whether you're screening candidates for an important position or looking for ways to improve productivity, Caliper can help. Caliper offers in-depth assessments for potential hires and current employees. Their deep knowledge and personality insights uncover key traits and behaviors, plus what motivates employees to succeed. Caliper's unique approach with every size company and industry, from startups to the Fortune 500. Plus, their science and expertise have helped over 30,000 businesses hire, retain, and develop top talent. Even better than all of this, Caliper has an incredible offer for Hack the Entrepreneur listeners. Assess your team for free. You'll discover what makes each person tick, and you'll improve the performance of your team. They'll also give you one hour of free consulting. To find out more, visit calipercorp.com hack. That's calipercorp.com hack. Get your team assessed for free, and grab that one hour of consulting right now. We are back with another episode of Hack the Entrepreneur, and today we have a very, very, very special guest. Carrie, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. So glad to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. My pleasure. I think think we're going to have a lot of fun, Carrie. So uh, let's jump into it, shall we? We shall. Excellent. Carrie, you're a woman who wears many, many hats. Today, we're talking to Carrie, the entrepreneur. So Carrie, as an entrepreneur, can you tell me what is the one thing that you do that you feel has been the biggest contributor to your successes so far? Ah, that's a big question. I've been in business for myself over 19 years, and I would say the Number one key to success, clue to success, way to success is probably showing up on a consistent basis in a really wise and strategic way. I like this. Showing up on a consistent basis, but then it doesn't stop there. Right. On a wise and strategic way? Yeah, in a wise and strategic way, because there are a lot of people that are doing a lot of things or going really quickly, but they're going in the wrong direction. So I have this image of Forrest Gump when he was running in my head. And fortunately for him, he didn't have a necessary destination in mind, but there are a lot of people hustling and grinding like that, but they don't know where they're going or what their ultimate goal is. And that's not wise or strategic. So I would say showing up on a daily basis and doing the right things for the right reason. Wow. Where, where, where are you going? You know, I think that evolves too. I think our journey evolves. My journey when I was in my twenties was different than my thirties and now different than my forties. And my journey with two kids was different than four kids. So I would say right now we've made a very strategic move to, I am a full-time keynote speaker, interviewee and writer. That is my that's the plan right now. And so where I'm going 
is instead of one-to-one communication, one-to-many communication, because I would love to share what I've learned in these 20 years and actually 45 years of, of parenting and leading teams and leading organizations. I would love to share that with people in a mass audience type of way. I love it. So I love this idea of how your direction evolves and can evolve. What, and should evolve. And ex- exactly. It's, it's almost absolutely necessary. How, how do you go about deciding at this stage that this is what you want? How you said it's kind of a recent thing, full-time keynote and writer. What sort of goes into the process of finding that direction? Yeah, I think that every entrepreneur, and that's who we'll address because that's who's listening, but every entrepreneur needs to know what their immediate motives are. Are. And this is why it should evolve because what was the most important thing to me and my family in my 20s is very different than now. And so my first need was to make a couple of thousand dollars a month so I could stay home with the two kids I had just adopted. That was my immediate need. John, I didn't have a big idea. I didn't have a burning passion. I didn't have business experience. I just had this need to be with my kids. And that's what drove me. Now, after I made that happen and figured that out, then my, my why and my need and, and my direction evolved to where I needed to, to pay off an extreme amount of debt, but also be present with my kids and, and shift some of my skill sets in a different way, leverage new technology that was on the scene because my first business was 98. So By 2002, the internet had already come a long way and we started working with some virtual business strategies in our service-based business. So I think it evolves based on how your family evolves, how your core values evolve. So to say we're this, let's use politics for a minute. Don't worry, it won't be dangerous. But (laughs) our politics, things that are important to us in politics are very different at 18 than they are when we're 68. Right. And rightfully so, because our lens changes, our view changes, our journey changes. And so if if your only goal is just make money, make as much money as possible, make as much money possible as fast as possible, that's not only not scalable or sustainable, that's not really going to hold your attention as you evolve. So I think that's where you follow that direction. So whereas I first just wanted to make a few thousand dollars and it didn't matter how, Mm -hmm. as long as it was legal and I could talk to my parents about it, you know, then, (laughs) then the next thing became what is scalable and sustainable and sellable. That became important to me. And then my, and that was a service business. I went from a sales business to a service business. Then I evolved into consulting, coaching, and content providing business as the Barefoot Executive in August of 2007. And now we're evolving again 10 years later. And that's a long evolve for an entrepreneur. But now we're evolving again into a place where I've been pulled. And that is thought leadership and mass communication. My goal was never be a speaker, be famous, be on stages. That was not a goal. But I've been pulled there because of experience and because of demand. And so that's now, because of the age of my kids and our flexibility, that's now where I'm turning. It's been a natural evolution. It's, and I also had a financial transition plan for that. You don't just wake up and go, oh, hey, I want to be a public speaker. So that's, that's how you have to map things out. Your evolution changes, the seasons of your family. And you know, like, just like in politics, things are different to you at different stages and ages of life. Exactly, exactly. And I'm happy that you said, that just the first need to just make money, as long as it was legal and you could tell your parents about it. Right. Because I think a lot of people, oftentimes they, they hear someone like at your stage and it's like, especially when you can start talking about purpose and changing from the stage, like hundreds of people or thousands of people at a time, it's hard when you really just need to make some money. Yeah. And to, have, and to still, but you want to have that drive of purpose, but at the same time, you can't really get there until you just make some money. Well, and here's the thing, what's wrong with our purpose and our passion being paying our bills? Exactly. I think we get too caught up in what we're doing and not caught up enough in who we're doing it for. Very well said. And my two kids that I adopted, they needed me. They didn't care if I was making pies or mowing lawns or baking cupcakes or creating websites. They just needed me. And so at that point, they were my driving 
force. They were my driving passion. I was not about to be entitled and stomp my feet and say, I can't start something until I'm passionate about it. I mean, you know, looking back at that now, that would have been silly to say, I'm going to work my job and be away from them all day, every day until I find something I'm passionate about. We've got to stop that. And the other thing is action can breed passion. Mark Cuban, I'll paraphrase, but Mark Cuban, the owner of the Mavericks and, you know, one of the founding folks at Yahoo, I believe, said action and momentum breeds passion. So do something, do it to the best of your ability and the results will make you passionate about doing more, whether or not you actually love the thing. My publishing company was a, a desktop publishing company for newsletters, and it's still in business now. I founded it March of 2002, done multiple millions of dollars in newsletters. At one point, we had 1,700 recurring clients per month that we were serving across the United States using dial-up internet, if you can believe. And, <laughs> and I was not passionate about newsletters, John. I was not passionate about clip art and design. And Microsoft Publisher, if you can even imagine, I was not passionate about that. But I was passionate in paying off six figures of debt, I was passionate in raising my kids. And by this point, I had added two more kids. So I had four. Passionate about giving my husband some options financially and at work. And so I also became passionate about the clients that I served. So the vehicle wasn't as important as the result and the benefit. Now, I am fortunate in that I get to do what I love now. And I am passionate about speaking and mass communication. And I love people. And I'm a big mama bear. I'm like the entrepreneurial mama bear. I'm very protective of my audience. I'm very protective of people being misled on wrong paths. But this is a 20-year journey. This is not an overnight success story. This is not something I woke up and decided, oh, I'm going to be a leader of masses and I'm going to be this big sister in business and I'm going to be protective and, and wrap my arms around this great tribe. That evolved as a result of me really respecting the work I was doing, respecting the people I was doing it for and not being entitled in thinking I had to do something I loved every single day. Because let's be honest, I've been married almost 25 years and I haven't woken up like crazy in love every single day. So maybe that's too honest for some people, but some days you just have to choose to do the work and stay married, right? And so that being said, I think just make your first dollar, figure out some systems and then figure out how you can do it in a better way, a happier way with more scale or with more passion. That's a, I love that analogy for it. That's a great analogy. It's a hard analogy because I know a lot of people have divorced and I'm not condemning divorce at all. I'm really not. My marriage is my marriage, which is not anybody else's marriage. But I'm saying on those days that I woke up and looked over and sometimes went, what in the heck was I thinking? You know, and <laughs> that's just reality, right? You have to choose to do the work. You have to choose to find the positive. You have to choose to focus on, okay, I'm doing this for these kids and for our life. And there was a redeeming in there. Let's, let's find some positive. And your business has to be the same way. Could we extend that out even further to like, sometimes, I mean, you can start a business for reasons and those reasons change to you or to what you want to accomplish. And that business might not be the one. And some people, I think just, it's like they forget sort of like the value of a sunk cost and they just want to keep putting time, energy and effort into it. And no matter what happened, no matter how good that business did, they would never be happy with it. Right. Sometimes you have to just <laughs> cut your losses. Sometimes you do. And I think that Seth Godin talks about this. And is it the dip that he talks about yes, this? Yes. And I think you have to know when to hold them and when to fold them. I'm a Texas girl. So let me quote Kitty Rogers. You have to know when to hold them and when to fold them. However, I think we also have to be wise enough to know if maybe we're just at the three yard line and maybe we're just so close we can't see. We're just too close to the goal. Somebody asked me yesterday, the most important thing I'd learned in the last year and a half. And nobody's ever asked me that before. And I had to think, and I said, I, I think what I've learned is that we're closer to our breakthroughs than we believe. And I stand by that even today after I've slept on it. We're closer to our breakthroughs than we believe. However, your breakthrough may be in that you say, I was only pursuing this because so-and-so looked like they loved it and I don't have any skill in it. And there's really not enough of a market for it. And I shouldn't be in this market period. So I need to 
You know, it doesn't matter if you've sunk 15, 20, $30,000 in it, whatever. If it's not going to work, it's not going to work. But then I think sometimes you have to look and say, I'm so close. I really am so close. And once I hit that breakthrough, then I can hire somebody to manage it or handle it or, you know, whatever. I, there has to be a balance. The, the important thing is, John, we are, as entrepreneurial creatures, first of all, I think you have to realize if you're entrepreneurial or not. And some people listening, I'm sorry if this is you guys, but some of you listening are, you have the hope of entrepreneurialism, but really you're employee wired. And it's really hard to change from one wiring to the other. And in that case, stick with your job, but maybe do a side hustle or a side thing that can still be fun, but that you don't have all your bills dependent on. But if you're really entrepreneurial wired, like several of us are, you have to know that we have a short attention span, that new projects are like crack to us. And we love the thrill, the excitement, the chase of the new. And so we're very quick to abandon the old, the stale, the aging. How do we know, Carrie, or how does <laughs> someone know if we're entrepreneurial wired or just fascinated by everything we see around it? Yeah, you have to know how comfortable are you with the risk of being responsible for recreating your paycheck every single day. You have to know, do you have a pattern of giving up time after time after time on your diet, on your health, on your fitness, on relationships, on a new town, on, you know, you have to know how well you work without supervision. If your whole goal of being an entrepreneur is so that you don't have an alarm clock and you can only work when you want to, and you can do what you want without a stupid boss then really entrepreneur may not be the thing for you because you're going to work more hours <laughs> than you are for somebody else. And you're going to have to work when you don't feel like it or when somebody hurts your feelings. But I think, John, the, the point is as entrepreneurs, we are emotional people. We are sometimes rashly driven. And this is when we have to be very self-aware and we have to say, okay, I cannot make this decision in the middle of a loss. I need to make sure I'm having a win day. I, I need to, you know, I've told my kids before, I don't care if you quit soccer, but we don't quit after a loss. We finish what we start and then we quit on a high note. You know, we, we don't ever quit doing musical theater after a bad audition. We wait until we have a little bit more of a win. We cannot make that an emotional decision. You need to make sure you're well-fed. Don't make decisions when you're hungry or hangry. Don't make decisions when someone has hurt your feelings or returned a product or service. Don't make decisions when you're sleep deprived or right after a big time investment of a launch. Make sure you're in a good, healthy time, space, physical energy, and then, then do the whole pros and cons list. Try to step outside of your emotion when you're making those decisions about, do I quit this? Do I keep this? What are the pros and cons? Am I only wanting to quit this because now I see something shiny that looks better or easier, or I think I have a shortcut, or is it because I really have given it my all and tried everything? There are stories after stories of people who say, I've tried everything and I can't lose weight. I've tried everything. I've been on every diet and I cannot lose weight. And then all of a sudden their kid needs a kidney transplant or their, their wife needs some kind of life-saving something but the, the person in question has to drop an amount of weight quickly in order to donate the kidney or to be part of the bone marrow transfusion. And guess what? All of a sudden it works. So did they really try everything? Did they really give it their all before or only when their back was up against a wall? So I think we have to be careful with the throwing our hands up in the air because as entrepreneurial emotional beings, our tendency is to walk away and abandon things, you know, the, the field of broken dreams, so to speak, when sometimes if we just hang in there and show up on a consistent and wise strategic basis, our results are different. I love it. So this, this idea of like not quitting something or making that sort of dramatic decision on a low note or after your dance recital or something didn't go well. I love how like you bring your kids into these stories. Do you think that the way you're teaching your kids will sort of push them to be more entrepreneurial? You know, I think it's made my kids very aware of if they're entrepreneurial or not. And I have two that are and two that are not. And of the two that are not, one of them thinks he is, but it's really because he, he has rebellion to authority. And so he thinks he should do something for himself. And yet he also knows that he just doesn't want to 
be very driven at all. <laughs> so it's helped my kids know, no, I really do like showing up and being told what's on the plan for today. I really do like knowing my check every quarter. I have two adult kids, two adult kids and two who are still at home. The two who are still at home are very risk okay. And they're very entrepreneurial. They're very driven. And, and I don't see them being traditional employees. I could be wrong, but I, I don't see it at this point. The older two are very employee driven and I don't see them owning businesses. Now I'm not projecting that onto them. I just lead them through, you know, some questions and self-discovery, but I don't know. I don't know that that wiring is something we can change if that makes sense. Yeah, it is. It really does make sense. And it's, it's, it's also, it's kind of, it's interesting to hear because those lessons that could be part of what defines you as like entrepreneurial wired are also just good lessons for life. Like right. don't make these rational decisions. Even if you want to take that path and have the job and be told how, what you need to do to get that paycheck, still don't make those decisions on when you're hungry or when things right. have gone bad. So I guess it helps in that way and it should help sort of throughout life no matter what. Right. Fair enough. Okay, so at the beginning, Carrie, um, you told me that your one thing is showing up consistently in a wise and strategic way. Now, every business expert talks about this 80-20 rule in business. You're supposed to find that 20% that gives you the 80% and you're supposed to do what you're good at and delegate the rest. Carrie, can you please tell me something that you are absolutely not good at in your business? <laughs> the uh, accounting Accounting and numbers. That's easy. I'm not, I'm not good at that. And I don't have the discipline to buckle down and learn it. So I have to outsource that. Did you, or do you feel that you learned this early enough or did you have to make some mistakes to figure this out about yourself? I got into six figures of debt. So a little bit too long. A little bit too long. And it was because I was managing my own finances and not paying attention and not being wise about inventory allocation and all the numbers. You know, we don't have classes in business finance unless we get a business degree. And even personal money management, there's not a lot of education that we get on that either unless we are self-learners. So yeah, I got myself in quite a mess. And ironically, I'm married to a man with an accounting degree who's a financial planner. And I had to turn it all over to him. And I had to say, okay, until we can figure this out together, I need you to help me get out of this mess, put this on paper, help deposit it where it goes. Let's pay this off. And I say let's, I mean, it was my business. I paid it off, but he had to help me with, we set aside this percentage for taxes. We're setting aside this percentage for expenses and for travel and for inventory replacement and all those things. And then now I've become a student. So I'm a huge fan of Profit First by Mike Michalowicz a huge fan of the Dave Ramsey method for getting out of debt. I believe you have to be a student. Even if you delegate it, you cannot be held hostage by what you do not know. So I believe in knowing the basics so that number one, I don't get myself back in that position again. And number two, I don't have an expert holding me hostage, extorting, or you know, me going to jail because they don't know enough. I need to know enough to make some intelligent decisions, but it doesn't mean I have to know the accounting software and I don't have to know how to fill out the form. I just need to know some basics of what's right, what's wrong and what's helpful. Enough to be dangerous. Enough to be dangerous. <laughs> so have you implemented or like put any sort of process into place to make sure that you don't take control of something again that you are not, shouldn't be in charge of? Well, I think, you know, having a meeting with your shareholders is necessary, chatting about what's going on, what's not going on, where the money is, especially if you know that's been a danger zone for you before. Annual taxes are always a good time for us to revisit what's working, what's not working, et cetera. But yeah, I think we need to put ego aside and know where our deficits are and where we need help, or maybe just where we're spending too much time. If I can do web design, but it takes me too much time. So I think being aware of that is helpful. That being said, when you're a shoe strap organization, when you're 
when you're starting out and having to do things yourself, it's helpful to have the basic knowledge of web design instead of saying, I can't do this until I have enough capital to X, Y, Z. There are too many helpful YouTube videos and tutorials and, and user-friendly softwares for us to be held hostage about really anything right now. And sometimes we have to suck it up, get over being a martyr and just handle it ourselves until we can afford help. Exactly, exactly. All right, Carrie, this has been an absolute blast. I, I want to wrap up on one final question for you, if I can. Okay. It's this idea I'm working with calling the entrepreneurial gap, which from talking to hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs now, it seems to be this gap that we sometimes live in as entrepreneurs, meaning that no matter what we accomplish or achieve, we always put our own personal success into the future. Meaning in one month when you hit that revenue metric that you want, or in six months when you stand on that stage that you've been shooting for. We both know that seconds before you hit that, you're going to set five or 10 bigger ones into the future, which I agree we kind of need to push forward, but we also end up in this gap that's like kind of walking towards the horizon that no matter how far you walk, the further away it always gets. Mm -hmm. um, so I would love it right now, Carrie. You've been through a lot. You've been at this game a long time, but if you could stop right now, turn around and look behind you, sort of the highs, the lows, the wins and the losses, and tell me how you feel about this whole journey until today. You know, I, I think that's really interesting. I've studied the gap a little bit with Dan Sullivan, who, who teaches that quite extensively. And I, I feel like I'm really good at celebrating daily and weekly successes. I feel like I'm really good at not only celebrating those, but encouraging my family and teaching the people around me how to celebrate those with me. If I look backwards over that 19 years, it's pretty incredible. It's phenomenal. I'm not dismissive of it at all. I've raised four amazing, well-adjusted kids and been present for the most important things. And we have funded over $100,000 for adoptions and orphan care with, with proceeds of our business. I've published a book. I have worked with many of my idols and mentors and shared stages with them. I've had opportunity that I never even set a goal for, much less could have even imagined. And more importantly are the emails and private messages that I get from individuals that say, because of you, because of your massive weight loss, or because of your debt story, or your depression story, or because of your vulnerability, or the fact that you just keep showing up, because of you, I'm making a change. Because of you, I see it's possible. Because of you, we're adopting. Because of you, I quit my job and now I'm pursuing a dream. I can celebrate all that and I can say that it's bigger, it's bigger than me. I had to show up and, and put the feet to it, but it's bigger than me. I, I believe our creator has big plans for us. I believe that people are good and amazing opportunity is unlimited and that if we show up in a wise and strategic way and keep doing the work and improving us, you know, we cannot change the world unless we change us first. And so I think it was Gandhi that said, be the change you want to see in the world. And so I started working on me, John, I started working on being my best me. And if I compare the me today, to the me 19 years ago and 15 years ago and 10 years ago and even five years ago. It's astonishing. It's absolutely astonishing. And yeah, I can celebrate that and I can be very proud and simultaneously humbled and honored by that at the same time. I love it. I love it. All right, Carrie, we've got to talk about your business and your book in passing. Could you now specifically tell the listener what your business is and then where they can track you down? Yeah. So my, my site is carriewilkerson.com. Carrie is spelled like the Stephen King novel. So carriewilkerson.com. And in there you can get on my mailing list for updates. You can get a seven day free video series and uh, get my voice in your head if you haven't had enough. Also, I'm on Facebook pretty actively at Barefoot Executive. My book is available, Amazon, Audible, all those places. It's called The Barefoot Executive. It's about creating your life your way and your business your way. I also am releasing two manuscripts at the same time in the next month or so. 
and information about those will be on Facebook, of course, and my website too. Very cool. Very cool. CarrieWilkerson.com. Um, I'll get links to the Barefoot Executive, the book, as well as we talked about Mark Cuban in passing, Seth Godin, The Dip, and Dan Sullivan's The Gap. I'm going to get links to those and put them onto Hack the Entrepreneur under Carrie Wilkerson for you for when you're done working, jogging, working out, whatever it is you're doing right at this moment. Carrie, once again, thank you so much for taking the time to stop by. Uh, thank you so much for sharing so openly. And please just keep doing what you're doing because it is awesome to watch. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the honor. Have you ever hired a promising applicant only to find out that their best performance was during the job interview? Well, whether you're screening candidates for an important position or looking for ways to improve productivity, Caliper can help. To find out more, visit calipercorp.com slash hack. That's C-I-L-I-P-E-R-C-O-R-P, calipercorp.com slash hack. Maybe now is the point in the show where I should concede to the fact that I'm really lucky to get to talk to brilliant, brilliant people like Brock on a daily basis. And then I get to share it with you. It's, I mean, it's amazing for me to get to ask the questions that I know you want and that I want to know the answer to from these smart people like Brock. And it's really, it's intriguing, it's exciting, it's engaging to be part of the conversation. But I also love this part of the show. The part where I get to go back and I get to listen. I get to listen like you listen. So I did that. I went back through the conversation with Brock and I listened. And then I went back again and I listened again. That second time back through the conversation, listening to it as you get to, as a third party, there was one thing that Brock had said to me and somehow I had missed it the first two times. But this time it was so very, very clear. It was that one thing that Brock said. Did you get it? Did you hear it? Let's do it. Let's find the hack. Just make your first dollar, figure out some systems, and then figure out how you can do it in a better way, a happier way, with more scale or with more passion. And that's the hack. Carry, carry, carry. So short, so to the point, and so very, very well said. Figure out how to make your first dollar. So I love this. This is sort of the last eight second of a very good sort of tirade almost. <laughs> she went on, it was awesome, about how, what's wrong with your passion being profits? What's wrong with you trying to just make money? There's nothing wrong with that, right? She talks about having adopted two kids who just, who didn't care if she had to mow lawns, if she had to make pies, or if she had to build websites. It didn't matter to them, and it doesn't matter to them. It doesn't matter to the bank who you're paying a mortgage to. It doesn't matter to your landlord. It doesn't matter to anyone else but you. How you make that money, make it work, and build your business and grow it. Right? Not unethically, but worrying about sort of finding the passion and your purpose. Your purpose can be, and your passion can be building a business. You build businesses based on money, based on bringing in more cash than goes out, making a profit, they say. Going way back, like a couple hundred episodes now, oh my God, when I say that, but Ryan Dice from digitalmarketer.com, he said his passion, how did he word this? It was something like, he's not passionate about markets per se, or like markets that he enters with businesses. He's passionate about business itself. The idea of building a business, making it profitable and scaling it is his passion. More so than he sells like, he sells like survival knives and he sells marketing courses. He sells all kinds of different things. But the idea of being passionate about business and just making your first dollar, as Carrie says, is huge. It's massive, right? It's not always, like I have a lot of people on here that we talk about your passion, finding your thing. And that kind of can kind of come in as an evolution, as an evolutionary process of becoming and building on your sort of career of entrepreneurship. But it doesn't need to come today. It might not need to come tomorrow or next week or next year. And then as Ryan's found out, I mean, 10, 20 years into this, 
that the passion can actually come from the businesses, the systems, the teams you build around it, no matter what it is market you're covering, what segment you're helping or benefiting from. Just make your first dollar, figure out some systems, figure out how this making money stuff works. And then after that, if you want, go back and try and figure out your passion. What you're probably going to find is that you're passionate about building businesses. Carrie, thank you so very, very much. All right, so here we are, hacktheentrepreneur.com. You've heard this URL hundreds of times now, or tens of times. Maybe this is the first time you've heard it. This is the first time you've ever listened to the show. I need you to go over there. I need you to get onto an email list. It's, it, there's one right at the front when you land there with my pretty face, and there's multiple ones sort of around the website. Some of them will get you different things at the front end. They're all going to end up with you getting my best writing, my best work, my best thoughts coming to you every Sunday, straight to your inbox, straight from my fingers on my laptop on a Sunday. <laughs> and another cool thing is I just ran our first workshop of the year, and it was about finding your focus and defining your 20%. And it was super successful. People seem to have loved it. We got like, I think just over or just under 50 people signed up. So I'm doing these workshops bi-weekly or so, tri-weekly maybe it's called, every three weeks, every two to three weeks. And I have four of them planned out already, but they're $25 to get in. It takes an hour live with me. And then you can ask me any questions you want. We record it so you can watch it as many times after as you want. And there's also a workbook to go with it. And then uh, a bonus PDF that went with the last one also to help you out. But the benefit is if you are on this email list, you get it significantly cheaper, but that's the only place to get it significantly cheaper. So it's a benefit to you to be on that email list. Not only do you get my best work coming to you every Sunday, but these next three webinars coming out or workshops, you're going to have access to before anyone else and less than half the price of anyone else. So if that's not an incentive to get on that email list, I don't know what is. I don't know. If, if you don't think it is, tweet me or something or email me and tell me that's not enough of an incentive. Tell me what would be an incentive. Because I'm pouring my heart and soul into those emails and you're just not even there listening or reading them. Or maybe you are. If you are, thanks. Also hit reply to any of them and say hi to me. I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> All right. That's enough of me for today. I greatly, 100% fully appreciate you stopping by. There's a ton of podcasts out there these days. And it's really cool that you decide to spend this sort of half hour, 40 minutes with me. I really appreciate it. So until next time, please keep hacking the entrepreneur. <laughs>